Today we are talking to Wendy Kopp. She's the founder of Teach for America and co-founder of Teach for All. This week they are gathering in Kathmandu to celebrate uh, these programs all across the world and also celebrate the achievements of Teach for Nepal. Well, Wendy, welcome to Nepal. Thank you. And uh, thank you for your time today. So you said this is your third visit to Nepal. Mm. So in the last three visits, what have you seen uh, in Nepal? Uh, well, I've had the chance to see Nepal through the eyes of, of Teach for Nepal, I guess. Um, and each time we've gone to different villages where the Teach for Nepal teachers are working. Um, you know, I was, I still remember so vividly my first visit um, to one of the villages where these incredible fellows who, you know, grew up in Kathmandu and went to a university here and had job offers from the local banks instead committed to do Teach for Nepal and were living in the houses with the students they were teaching. One of them, this woman, incredible woman was sharing a bed with one of the students she's working with and just the level of commitment and that they were demonstrating it was was amazing it was so cold and you know to think that she's like I, I said aren't you cold and she's like that's the worst part like you know I have my hot water bottle but I left just so amazed by the level of commitment of these fellows. Um, it's just, I, I see similar things around the world, but you know, the level of commitment they were demonstrating was just at a whole other level. So you came up with this idea of, you know, having this fellowship program to go out and teach in these, you know, poor schools uh, in, in America. So why education? So what triggered you and what was your childhood like? Well, I, I grew up um, in going to public school in, in a very privileged community. My parents weren't from a really privileged background themselves, but they kind of bought their way into this community knowing that, that it had good public schools. Um, and so I you know, got one of probably the best educations you could get in the US and went to Princeton where you know, you can't begin to see the disparities that persist in, in the United States. But what you can really see on any college campus in my country is how differently prepared people are based on where they grew up. Um, my freshman year roommate had gone to public school in the South Bronx, which is a very high poverty community in the U.S. And I saw through her and through her friends, all these first generation college students, how differently prepared we were. And it just got me thinking about the fact that our country, which aspires so admirably to be a place of equal opportunity, really isn't one. Um, that where you're born actually does so much to determine the educational outcomes you get and, and in turn your life outcomes. Um, and, and so as a public policy major, I started learning more about it. Um, and as I got to my senior year and asked myself what I really wanted to spend my life doing, I realized, you know what, I feel like I could do anything. And that's just because of the kind of education I've had. And if I can figure out how to help many more people get a good education, like that's the path to freedom. And, and so that, that was all running through my head as I decided, as I came to this idea. So what made you think that this would work? Yeah. Well, I actually organized a conference on this topic of education. Um, you know, I was working for an organization that would bring student leaders together with business leaders and kind of government leaders to talk about like the issues of the day. And so the topic was educational inequity in our country. And we had students from all over the country there. And we were, I was in a group where you know, some of the students started saying, you know, we would teach in urban and rural regions, like the highest need regions in the U.S., if we were just recruited to do so. Like, I didn't know that there was a need for teachers. And that just sparked a thought because, you know, our generation was known as the me generation. Supposedly, we all just wanted to go work for banks on Wall Street. And I was convinced it wasn't the generation that everyone I knew was just searching for a way to make a real difference in the world. 
And in that meeting, at the time people were saying, I would teach, I just thought of this idea, why aren't we being recruited as aggressively to commit two years to teach in urban and rural public schools as we were being recruited to commit two years to work for banks? So I needed a thesis topic and decided to propose it in my thesis, and, and it kind of yeah, all went from there. Point. Yeah. Yeah. So coming back to Teach for Nepal, so in the last five years, they have done a remarkable job here. Mm. So, you know, what have you seen in, in Teach for Nepal? And, you know, what, from your perspective, how do you think Teach for Nepal could scale up so that they could really make, a, you know, an mm. impact in Nepal's uh, education? Mm. Well, first of all, the reason that we're convening our whole global community in, in Nepal, I mean, we'll have 400 people from something like 64 countries here immersing ourselves in the approach of Teach for Nepal because they've done such a, I think, amazing job in kind of creating a program that's responsive to the needs expressed by people in the villages and, and by developing such a a strong partnership with the folks in those villages. I think it's just remarkable that only five years into their history, it's actually financial support from the local governments that's enabling them to grow, for example. Um, and what we've seen through our work globally is that uh, working in deep partnership with communities in pursuit of kind of community level progress towards the aspirations of the people in those communities is really, I mean, that's what we want to be about all over the world. Um, so we're, I'm so excited about the foundations they've built here. And I think in, you know, talking with the founder of Teach for Nepal and, and CEO Shasir, um, clearly he, believes the need is is immense and that you know he wants to reach the point where not just a few but many of Nepal's you know rising graduates are channeling their energy um, into villages and and working in the short run but then committing themselves throughout their lives to work from wherever they are in society towards ensuring all kids in Nepal have the chance to fulfill their potential. So how do you get to that scale? Like it seems the only way will be if we can figure out how to unlock the financial resources to, to operate at a greater scale. Um, because the governmental support, the support in the villages, and even the potential, you know, the numbers of potential recruits seem significant. So it feels like the, the biggest constraint is around financial support. There's also money coming in this country for education, health, you name mm. it. But somewhere the money is being lost, not being channeled into mm. you know programs like these. So is these for all thinking in that direction to really help, you know, especially in programs in developing countries to tap into those resources? Yes. You know, this is the question that's keeping us up at night, just because all over the world in, in low income and low to middle income countries, the constraint is, you know, a lot of people told us the constraint would be the people, the recruits, um, or the government, but no, we're not finding that. We're finding that um, the only constraint is, is financial resources. And so we think about all the development aid that exists out there. It's something like 13 or $14 billion a year in education. And how can we find a way for more of that funding to get to local NGOs that are really having a sustainable impact and building local leadership capacity? Because right now, a lot of those funds go either to governments or to international NGOs that can you know, promise really significant scale, um, but we need to figure out how to get more of the funding to the local NGOs that can play such a vital role in building the local leadership capacity. So tell us about this global gathering. The, uh, I understand this is an annual gathering, and yeah. why did you guys choose to host this in Nepal? Well, um, each year we gather the kind of key mm -hmm people and supporters of the now 48 Teach for All network partners around the world and prospective partners together. Um, you know, we center our, our work around, you know, we, we host this gathering in a different part of the world each year and centered around different themes that we choose as a way to advance our collective thinking. Um, 
And we're coming here to Nepal to immerse ourselves in the very community-centered approach that Teach for Nepal has taken, because we think it's so crucial to ultimately reaching our goal, which is, and, and vision, you know, which is community level progress all over the world. People showing that it's possible for kids across whole communities to have the education and support and opportunity necessary to be able to shape a better future for themselves and all of us. And the only way to get there is to orient our work towards communities and working in deep partnership with those communities towards the aspirations that they have. Um, and while it's early in its journey, we've seen so much evidence of the just incredibly strong partnership and support that Teach for Nepal has in, in its villages. So what are some of the ways that you can think that you know, Nepal as a country and also Teach for Nepal as an institution can you know, benefit from your experiences and experience of Teach for All and Teach for America? Because there's you know, the urgent need and intervention at all levels of our mm. education system here. So can you think of some of these uh, experiences that might be very useful to us? Um, I mean, I guess what we've seen is that the challenges we're facing all around the world and countries around the world in education are actually so similar. So there are huge challenges in Nepal, but there are huge challenges in virtually every country. And those challenges look, look actually very similar, which means there's a lot more that's shareable about the solutions than than we've realized, I think, as a global education community. Um, so there's so much we can learn from Nepal and, and also so much that the Teach for Nepal fellows and alumni and staff members are learning from their colleagues in other parts of the world, in other low-income countries and high-income countries alike. Um, you know, I think at the core of our work is the question of how do we develop a growing leadership force of people who will ultimately work at every level of the system and outside the system as well, at every level of policy and, and across sectors to ultimately affect the systemic changes we need to see. And so, like, the core of our work is around leadership development. You know, how do we recruit and select the most promising future leaders of Nepal and train and support them so that they succeed with their students and learn the right lessons about what it takes for kids to have the chance to fulfill their potential and then go on and continue to work you know with informed by their experience in the classroom for change at every level of policy and and in different areas so one of the things we've done as a global community is to create communities of practice for the alumni of these organizations around the world who are pursuing similar forms of change. So we have a community of practice for all the people working in their ministries, like the education ministries, and for all the people who are pursuing you know, changes in, in teacher development in their countries, people who are trying to start truly transformational schools for kids in low-income communities. And ultimately, we're envisioning dozens and dozens of communities of practice that enable these kind of, this kind of rising generation of leaders to learn from each other across borders and to learn from some of the leading thinkers and practitioners in the world as well. So has there been some thought and discussions on, like, maybe you know, it's a good idea to experiment with, you know, sending uh, TFN fellows to TFI fellows, you know, mm. sort of exchange the programs and you know maybe there could be some experiences that could benefit both of these countries. Has there been some kind of thought along those lines? I mean, we we have in fact built these communities of practice that enable people who are pursuing similar interest areas as alumni from these different countries to really get to know each other um, and learn from each other. So you know, as an example, last year two years ago we launched an organ a community of practice around teacher development so we found some of the real leaders in the alumni communities from it was like 13 different countries who are pioneering whether it's from within the government or through kind of nonprofit social enterprises changes in the way other teachers are developed it's just one common thing that across the world people feel like we need to change and so we had people from India and people from Chile and people from the US and, and from nine other countries learning from each other. And all of them, I mean, they come back to us saying how much those gatherings push their thinking. And the people in the US are saying that just as much as the people in, 
you know, India or kind of less developed countries. So for many years, you're laser focused on making sure that, you know, this for America is, you know, is scalable and, you know, it has an impact. Then you sort of started this uh, Teach for All sort of global movement in 2007. So what made you sort of think, you know, beyond your borders? Actually, what made me think, uh, I, I had my head down and was fully focused on the U.S. because there are just so many challenges in my own country. Um, but I, I met probably 13 people from 13 different countries within one year about 13 years ago. Um, and they were people who were coming to us saying, we really need to see this happen in India or in Chile or China or you know, many different places around the world. And that's what ultimately led to the idea of Teach for All as a network of independent, locally led, driven organizations um, that all are brought together by a common purpose and a set of shared principles and, and kind of a common vision that we're working towards. So as you travel around the world, you know, seeing these programs uh, take off, so what are some of the things that, that, that really inspires you? What inspires me is to see, um, see the, you know, I guess what brought us into this is a belief that in the end, it, local leaders are what change things. And the only path to the kind of transformational change we need to see in education is is for it to be led by locally rooted leaders, people who are so immersed in their own culture and context. Um, and so to see such incredible hearts, minds, and souls all over the world, I mean, whether it's in Nepal or, you know, Uganda or Brazil, I mean, it, it, no matter where in this network, I meet the same caliber of people who are driven by kind of the same values, who are deciding to channel their energy into this, and, and then watch the same leadership effects, the impact they have during their two years of teaching, and there's growing amounts of research that show that they have a positive impact on their kids, both academic and socio-emotional development. Uh, and then to see you know, the degree to which this experience, the committing just two years, really changes everything for them. Like it changes their career paths. More than 75% of the people who commit two years to this across the world are still in education. Um, the degree to which it changes their DNA. I mean, it really influences the way they see and understand the world. And, and to see the kind of leadership that these people assume, even you know, it, it really early on in their career, um, launching social enterprises, moving into their government ministries, you know, becoming, you know, really highly regarded veteran teachers. I mean, such diverse pursuits. Um, but that's probably the most inspiring thing. You know, I think one thing that we've learned over the last 10 years is the degree to which, I mean, it's so true that, you know, Nepalese leaders will, will be the change in, in Nepal. And yet we've also seen how much more quickly local leaders can move when they're globally informed, meaning exposed to what's working and what's possible in other places. And so that's really what we're working to do across Teach for All is to kind of grow the numbers of locally rooted and globally informed leaders um, who, who will be committed to changing things for kids. So how do you characterize this movement? So it is like an ideological movement? Is this a cult? I guess we could call it a global movement, um, you know, of people in their countries saying we need to ensure that the young people in our countries have the kind of education and the support and opportunity to be able to navigate a changing economy, solve these increasingly complex problems that face our society locally and, and globally. Um, we're just not on a path to, you know, we need to get on a path to the young people growing up today, having the competencies and the values and the sense of agency and the awareness to be able to shape a better future for all of us. Like what could be more important to all of our global aspirations. And so it, it's to see this kind of rising generation of leaders in all these different countries 
deciding to channel their energy into the arena of working with the most marginalized kids in their countries in pursuit of that kind of shared vision, meaning like our students growing as leaders who can shape a better future for all of us, so inspiring. So if you look at some of the political developments, especially in the West, you know, some of these big countries are, you know, increasingly looking inwards, at least mm. temporarily that's what we see from here. Yeah. Um, you know, and so there's a trade wars going on and all, all sorts of things. So, you know, how does programs like these, how do these programs sort of connect these communities and, and, and you know, sort of global community that you're talking about? It's so interesting because while we see our, our highest governmental leaders um, turning inwards, our community couldn't be more different. You know, it's just so many people even even across countries where you see lots of geopolitical challenges really working together and reaching out to help each other. And I think what we're all seeing is we can move so much more quickly when we're learning from each other across borders. Um, hopefully, um, you know, the kind of citizen power of that will take over and and ultimately, you know, we'll convey those same values to the kids growing up today who will grow up hopefully understanding that we're all better off if, if when each other are, are better off. Um, you know, 10 years, 15 years down the road, like what do you like to see? Hopefully we will reach the point where in virtually every country in the world, there are growing numbers of, of the most promising leaders channeling their energy towards ensuring that the young people growing up in our countries can in fact shape a better future for all of us. Um, and, and hopefully we'll see not only growing numbers of teachers and leaders within countries, but we'll have a real network that enables them to learn from each other in pursuit of accelerating progress. You know, I think in other sectors like the environment or in health, We've realized long ago that our fates are interconnected, the solutions are shareable, and there's quite a global ecosystem that helps local people learn from each other. We need to see the same thing in education, and I think Teach for All can be part of what creates that global ecosystem so that we can move from, I mean, if you look at educational outcomes across the world, we're on sort of this trajectory and we need to be on this trajectory and we think if we can build a growing force of locally rooted leaders all around the world who have avenues to learn from each other that we can we can get on that trajectory so one of the things that you talked about last night was you know um, you, you talked about land preset so one of the things he says that developing countries have done an excellent job in the last decade or so in, in putting kids in classrooms but we have yet to figure out, you know, how to, yeah. how to, you know, make sure that they learn in, in inside classrooms. So, is that something that that you know, Teach for Nepal is working on? It. This is the central challenge that unites all of us across the so Teach for All network. Um, is to figure out how do we. I mean, that's kind of the core of our whole of all of our work is around how do we, you know. Leadership is everything, first of all. I mean, you think about every successful organization in the world, whether it's a technology organization or company or a government, will say people are everything. And, and the only way to have the leadership we need is to make a really intentional effort to cultivate it. And in education and the social sector, we haven't historically done that. And that's what all these organizations are working to do, to say we're going to go out and aggressively recruit some of the best educated folks in our country. We're going to cultivate their energy, you know, make sure they're working to address our country's greatest needs um, and foster their ongoing leadership, all in a way that catalyzes other leadership and, and supports the leadership of the students and other teachers and other community members where we're working. Um, that is ultimately the key to all kids learning. Um, you know, we need to be centered in the mission of all kids learning. Um, but if we take, and you think about Lant Pritchett's work around like what differentiates governments that work versus those that don't, it's so much about the capacities of the people in positions of influence. And um, we're working to, to grow a force of people who are 
rooted in and deeply understand the challenges facing kids, the actual solutions for them, and who will commit themselves to working ultimately at every level of the system to create a whole system that's oriented around not just kids being in school, but kids learning. So you're hopeful that this will keep on growing? This movement will grow to more countries and more people will be part of this? Yes, we're, you know, um, in deep pursuit of essentially the resources necessary to both, you know, help the network partners scale, help Teach for Nepal scale in their own countries, and at the same time to continue growing to include all the more countries and particularly low income and low to middle income countries. So when you visit Nepal next time, what, what do you like to see here? I'd love to see, well, first of all, Teach for Nepal is on such an amazing trajectory. I mean, they've grown by, you know, 50% each of the last two years, um, all in response to demand from their local communities. Um, and I hope that trajectory continues and that they can find a path to the financial resources necessary for it to continue, which probably means accessing some of the kind of foreign aid or development um, funding out there, which is something they haven't yet been able to do. Well, well thank you for your time. Thank good you luck. so much for helping us get the message out. Thank you for your time and good luck.